Hello, my name is uh, Maarten Vergoot and together with uh, Jeff Ongena, I welcome you to the webinar on renewable energy uh, systems and their, their role in the electricity production of today and in the future. So we'll talk about electricity production and our focus will be on the uh, European uh, case. Okay, before turning to the topic of uh, Today, let me remind you the important difference there is between energy and power. When you mix these two things, the discussion becomes very quickly uh, very confusing. Okay, but if you keep in mind the uh, analogy that there exists uh, between, on the one hand, velocity and power, and on the other hand, distance and energy, it's rather simple. Energy is nothing else than the time integral of the power function. Okay which is reflected in the units that are used for the energy consumption kilowatt hours that you find on your uh, bills, electricity bills, um, other more general energy bills, uh, which are either monthly numbers or yearly numbers. That makes a whole difference. And in fact, for your energy discussion, the parameter of the time uh, lapse that you are uh, discussing is, uh, is rather important. OK, so now. How is our electricity in Europe um, uh, produced? Actually, all three major primary energy sources uh, can produce electricity. You have fossil, fossil fuel power plants, you have nuclear reactors, and you have uh, renewable energy devices, uh, photovoltaics that uh, produce electricity on the basis of solar radiation, uh, wind turbines that turn wind into electricity, you have biomass uh, fired uh, power plants, etc. Now, every of these three groups has its own pros and contras. Okay, let's start with the most traditional fossil fuel fired uh, power plants. Um, they uh, are relatively simply, have a, a lot of uh, knowledge about them, are up to, up to the now not too expensive, uh, but the biggest uh, uh, disadvantage is, of course, their huge amount of CO2 uh, emissions in production. Okay, so because of the link with climate change, uh, people uh, want to get rid of them. So we now uh, try to uh, uh, look a little bit into nuclear uh, fission reactors. There, there is no CO2 emission in operation. It's a rather compact device. You can put it on board of uh, ships, for instance. But the uh, uh, inconvenience is that you are left with uh, uh, nuclear waste after the uh, energy production. So this again actually is not wanted by the public opinion and we are left with only one set of renewable energies, the uh, uh, primary energy sources uh, based on, on wind, solar. And I left already out uh, the uh, biomass uh, uh, primary energy because uh, when you turn biomass into electricity, it's by combustion, and then you emit CO2 as well. So we leave that out. Actually, hydropower you can put between brackets as well, because the um, uh, future uh, potential of new hydropower stations in Europe is very limited. So we end up with possibilities on wind turbines and on solar photovoltaics. Both kind of devices are rather small devices in uh, nominal power compared to the uh, the two uh, other groups of two other classes, uh, fossil and, and nuclear uh, reactors. That makes that in order to scale up the total electricity production by means of these uh, wind turbines and photovoltaics, you will have uh, to deploy a lot of devices and that is uh, based on the property of the very low energy density of the underlying wind and so and sunshine okay on the other hand there is the uh, the advantage of course of uh, zero emission net zero emission in operation now we are excluding of course the manufacturing of of the devices uh, but okay now if you rely only on wind and solar, you can run into troubles. In German, they have uh, invented a word for this. When there is Dunkelflaute, days without wind and without sunshine, during the night or in dark uh, uh, winter days, you don't have any primary energy sources. 
Well, in our lab, we believe it is important to have in this kind of situations, uh, it is better to have a fourth pillar of uh, 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 electricity production uh, method based on environmental uh, friendly um, uh, energy source. It's actually uh, uh, hydrogen uh, that leads by thermonuclear fusion to production of electricity. Jeff Ongena will uh, tell you the latest evolutions on this uh, research area in a minute. Okay, let's uh, look at the uh, numbers uh, now about uh, electricity production. In Europe, electricity production asks only for one quarter, 25% of the total primary energy use. So it's not the biggest problem when we want to decarbonize the primary energy use. Of course, this uh, fraction is slightly increasing because of uh, the fact that more electric cars uh, come into the market and uh, uh, more um, uh, heat pumps replace traditional uh, heating systems. Okay, now comparing Europe to the uh, world situation here as well, actually, uh, uh, the world uh, as you uh, uh, sum these numbers on this, uh, in this table on the left-hand side, you end up with a, a fossil, fossil energy uh, fraction of around 80%. This is decreasing in function of time, but we are far from, uh, from uh, net zero, of course. Europe is already ahead of uh, the world average in this energy transition with that respect. And okay, 10% is, is a significant uh, uh, advantage already. Okay, this uh, difference uh, you immediately see in the CO2 emissions uh, as well, of course, eh? uh, second line here with the total emissions, purely CO2, no other greenhouse gases uh, are here uh, mentioned. These are numbers of 2020, so very recent. And uh, as you can see, the total fraction of, of the CO2 emission in, in Europe, in the EU 27, is uh, far less than 10% uh, of the global emissions. And compared to big emitters like the United States and China, actually, we are far below, even if you would count uh, the numbers uh, pro, per capita, actually. So, if you want to do significantly better to show the world in which way we have to evolve in order to do our uh, uh, energy transition, we have to uh, propose an excellent example. Let's see um, to what uh, leads the uh, uh, proposal that uh, Germany uh, started uh, more or less 15 years ago with their Energiewende, so that was based on wind turbine electricity and solar photovoltaic electricity. Today, numbers of 2020, and we see that uh, these two electricity quantities represent only 20% of the total electricity mix in Europe. Knowing that the electricity uh, represents only one quarter of the primary energy input, uh, you, you end up with the equivalent of more or less 5% of primary energy or or ecological footprint for the wind turbine and, and solar photovoltaic electricity. It's not negligible, but it's still a, a, a minor fraction. If you see uh, written next to it, uh, the bill that, 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 that this has cost uh, to, to Europe, it is a rough estimation of 1,000 billion of euro. Okay. This is an immense uh, uh, number, but difficult to grasp. But if I uh, tell you that this represents uh, twice the value of the gross domestic product for Belgium, you can get an idea of the amplitude. So it has not been so cheap in the past because of the incentives, the feed-in tariffs, of course, and also a lot of subsidies that has been given. In the future, that will be not that expensive, but that's the past. Now, zooming in onto the situation in Belgium, we see that Belgium is, is even more, let's say, dependent on primary energy because we, in average, consume almost uh, twice the value of uh, the European average, here expressed per capita and per day. But we can conclude immediately that for the total Belgian economy, having affordable and continuously available uh, primary energy is of crucial importance and for actually as well for all Belgian citizens, okay? Now, 
let's turn uh, to more uh, technical part of the uh, solar photovoltaic and wind electricity uh, production and uh, for this i take the example again of uh, in germany of course because their system uh, renewable system is uh, the best developed here you see a time trace of uh, uh, power production and uh, consumption from february 22 um, the top uh, level of this brown colored uh, area represents actually the um, the uh, load demand curve and uh, what, uh, what 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 numbers of power in function of time is, is asked for by the total uh, um, german grid okay it's fluctuating you can clearly see the difference between weekend days and, and weekdays between day and night uh, variation in average you can roughly approximate them the average power as being more or less 60 gigawatt 60,000 uh, megawatt to be compared with the red line on the top which uh, represents the to at that moment the total installed renewable uh, energy production based on wind 55 gigawatt of uh, wind onshore 10 gigawatt of wind offshore and 55 gigawatt of solar photovoltaic installations 120 gigawatt you can clearly see that this is the double than what is actually an average needed and then on the bottom you see actually the two colors the blue color represents the wind power in function of time intermittently uh, uh, fluctuating all the time and on top of the wind power you see added onto it the uh, uh, production of the photovoltaic uh, panels the panels of course produce during daytime and these peaks the daily peaks actually align very nicely with the daily peaks in the demand curve so that is a nice property of uh, photovoltaics but it's uh, more the intermittency of the wind as you can see for instance on the right hand side at this saturday of the 26th uh, where this uh, yellow ellipse is drawn there uh, you have such a situation before sunrise or after sunset of dunkelflote where actually a lot of uh, uh, power plants need to be uh, switched on Okay, one could uh, argue, uh, let's cut the uh, uh, daily peaks a, a little bit. That's what we call peak shaving and, and store this energy in order to use it uh, after sunset. In the summertime, when there is uh, maybe 55 gigawatt of production of solar panels, this is a perfect idea. This is a perfect theoretical idea, but then you have to have storage means, of course. And here I show you the order of magnitude of the total storage capacity in Germany. We talk about pumped hydro storage. It's the uh, technology of uh, hydroelectricity, but based on two artificial lakes, a lower lake and, a, and an upper lake. And in, in between which you switch actually huge uh, masses of, of water, huge uh, quantities of potential energy and so there is a limit in the velocity or of the or the power actually that's the the vertical uh, uh, amplitude of this uh, uh, small rectangle that i have drawn there so uh, the total capacity in germany it's uh, eight and a half gigawatt okay but as well you have a limit in the total uh, electricity the total energy that can be stored so it's a time limit in the horizontal axis more or less in average always four to five hours order of magnitude so clearly you can immediately see that the surface that that represents that small rectangle there is not going to solve the lack of uh, wind electricity on the right hand side in this uh, yellow uh, um, yellowish um, ellipse there okay let's uh, look a little bit further to another example we take uh, the month of february of 23 actually last month and we do the same analysis you have the same colors on the left hand side for germany with uh, again the, uh, the the clear distinction between week and weekend days etc uh, what is different now is the uh, wind production there is the wind has been split into offshore and onshore but you can clearly see several days in these uh, uh, first two weeks of this month where you don't have much wind actually and then when the sun has uh, has gone after sunset you have this dunker float again problems okay on the right hand side you have a uh, similar discussion but for france 
uh, it's clear that France does not have uh, that high capacity, that high uh, nominal capacity in, in wind power, but that makes the variation or the fluctuations or the intermittency to be solved by the other power plants uh, less, uh, let's say, uh, difficult. Now, if you look in the other power plants, what is colored in in brown there, right? We can split up in different components. We have switched a little bit the order and have put the uh, solar uh, contribution on top, the wind just underneath, and then uh, starting from the bottom, you see uh, with an almost stationary uh, power production, the nuclear, what we call base load electricity uh, uh, production. On top, then you have the coal and the uh, uh, gas-fired uh, uh, plants and uh, it's in the end the hydro and biomass uh, units that try to uh, let's say complement the uh, fluctuations into the load uh, curve on the one hand and the uh, uh, renewable energy production wind and solar photovoltaic uh, uh, um, plants on the other hand on the other hand okay if this complementation is not perfect then you can sell electricity by exporting it it's what you see on the bottom side of this uh, uh, picture in red with the negative power that is sold to the neighboring countries you can do the same discussion uh, for uh, Germany and then you end up with uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, situations with only three nuclear power plants that still produce uh, this uh, base load uh, uh, electricity and pink on the bottom and then uh, you clearly see uh, how uh, heavily you have to modulate the um, uh, other other uh, coal-fired and gas-fired power plants in order to uh, uh, adapt the uh, uh, production uh, to the uh, load demand. And that is not uh, done perfectly, as you can see on these export numbers, uh, reaching easily uh, several times in, in the month, the level of more or less 10 gigawatts uh, going out of uh, the country. In that respect, we can mention an example that uh, now, since two years, Belgium has also an interconnector with uh, uh, Germany. It's the Allegro interconnector, order of magnitude of one gigawatt of electric uh, power that can be uh, exchanged with uh, Germany through the bound through our border there. Uh, so one compared to more or less 10, uh, not an average, but uh, at several days uh, during the month, uh, you need to have uh, enough interconnectors to exchange this excess energy uh, with. Okay, this brings us to the conclusions. It's clear, I think, that the variability of the renewable energy uh, uh, sources complicates the management of uh, uh, the power grid and the control of, of, of the power grids. It's uh, even almost problematic, I would say. Um, uh, total solution decarbonization uh, of decarbonization based on renewables, I don't think that is the best uh, choice. I don't see it even possible. Uh, I have mentioned uh, financial aspects. I have mentioned uh, physical technical aspects linked to uh, wind and, and, and sunshine. <clears throat> I did not touch a word on uh, Pandora's box about the raw materials and the mining issues that you need to solve in order to produce all these devices, wind turbines and um, photovoltaics, right? That's another topic. I did not touch on it. Um, and then thirdly, I think we can uh, have uh, more success by putting more uh, uh, importance on uh, clean and dispatchable and dispatchable, sorry, uh, primary energy sources, as uh, we can have for this for the time being, uh, nuclear fission with the actual reactors or the modu uh, the small modular reactors in the future or on a longer time scale, uh, fusion, nuclear fusion, which is going to be discussed by Jeff. We now come to the last class of energy options, namely the nuclear options. And uh, the first I would like to briefly discuss is nuclear fission, which is an excellent option for climate and energy. And why do I say this? Well, I say this because in fact, if you look at uh, the reactor, it contains only ura uranium. The uh, cooling tower only emits uh, water vapor. So there is no C uh, during production. That means no CO2 is produced. It is also a method that is not subject to natural fluctuations. And it is a dispatchable energy source. It means you can regulate the output 
of this uh, plant to the needs of the grid. And is nuclear energy uh, something of the past? Well, if you look at the developing countries, certainly not. Because here we have the example of China, where about 50 units are now in production, 41 are under construction, and about 200 are planned up to 2035. Some words, anyhow, on Tianj 2 and Dul 3. You see here uh, a slide from a presentation of the funk. And uh, in fact, they show the uh, vessel here with all the different parts of the vessel. And um, the, all these parts were checked with the new method in 2012, which looked much deeper than before inside the metal. And what did they see? Well, that most of the parts of the vessel were okay, and that only two of them showed flaws. One first direct conclusion from this research is that uh, the reaction, the nuclear reaction, is not the cause for the flaws in these rings, um, because otherwise, because they consist of the same steel, they should all be damaged. This is not the case, and after a long investigation and many checks, um, the conclusion was that these bubbles, not cracks, but bubbles, were present during the casting of the steel in the steel plant. Uh, and now, over the years, they have checked. Th these bubbles don't move. They are really frozen into the metal matrix. And so they do not cause any um, uh, danger for the safety or for the operation of the plant. And in fact, these reactors could continue for many more years. Now we come to the uh, future nuclear option, which is nuclear fusion, which belongs to the expertise of the Laboratory of Plasma Physics of the Royal Military Academy. It is a future energy source and development with excellent environmental compatibilities. Let us have first a look at what is a fusion reaction and compare it to a fission reaction with uranium. Uh, this can be easily done using the table of Mendeleev. And in fact, in the sun, Hydrogen is uh, combined into helium. Uh, the fusion reaction uh, produces helium from the first element to the second element in the table of Mendeleev. On Earth, we will do the same, but we will not use hydrogen as it is, but the isotopes of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, and they also combine into a helium nucleus according to the reaction which is shown on this diagram. What is then the difference with fission? Well, in fact, in fission, you uh, split a large nucleus into uh, smaller ones. In fusion, you combine small nuclear nuclei to a larger one. In both of these processes, is a little bit of mass is lost, and due to the um, law of Einstein, E is mc squared, you can gain energy. And from all this, we can immediately uh, deduce the promises of fusion energy. In fact, uh, <coughs> It has a minimal impact on the environment. Why? Because the end product is helium, a noble gas, as we discussed the slide before. And that means that there are no greenhouse, it is not a greenhouse gas, and there is no chemical reaction, so no ozone layer uh, attack or no, uh, no acetrain uh, products. And in fact, uh, helium is a very inter in this, uh, in interesting industrial product but is the, because it is the only gas that remains liquid at absolute zero. So it can be used for all superconducting applications. There is no need for a very long term storage of active phase because uh, one of the um, products we use on Earth is radioactive hydrogen, tritium, but it is consumed in the reaction, it disappears. Then uh, the other point is that, of course, we have a nuclear reaction going on in a reactor. This reactor um, will be activated, that means the metallic wall of the reactor. But we, can, uh, we are now investigating um, several different alloys, which should be recyclable after about 100 years. And that means that the generations that produce the waste can also recycle it for another reactor or for other applications. Then it is an inherently safe uh, method because, in, in fact, we have a complicated gas burner. We have to, pro to, to uh, deliver continuously the two products, the deuterium and tritium, the two isotopes of hydrogen. And if something goes wrong, we close the input and after a few seconds, the whole product stops. That means no runaway reactions are possible. There is no afterheat problems. And that means also accidents like Chernobyl, Three Mile Island or Fukushima are completely excluded. The fuels, essentially water and lithium, lithium to produce the radioactive uh, isotope, are abundantly available everywhere on Earth. 
and uh, this means that you are greatly uh, uh, you have a greatly reduced supply dependence and also there is a minimal consumption 15 grams for 80 years uh, of one person's electricity in Europe and looking at the reserves we have here then a source for thousands of years if not more the only problem is difficult and the difficulty comes from the 150 to 200 million, de million degree needed to start a fusion reaction and there some questions immediately come up and the first one is how do you put this hot gas in something well in fact we make uh, use of the interesting property of uh, hot gas that it becomes completely ionized it means from the neutral atoms uh, you, the, 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 the heat splits them into charged particles electrons black and ions red they are all charged and charged particles there you can do something very interesting namely using a magnetic field if you have a cylinder without a magnetic field the particles will bombard the cylinder and melt it if you have a magnetic field and you put the magnetic field parallel to the axis then the particles the charged particles uh, and they are charged because the temperatures are hot are starting to gyrate along the lines and uh, the magnetic field is in fact guiding them how to move and we can protect the wall of the tube but of course the tube is open at both ends we need to find a solution not to lose everything at once and in fact two tests have been done to close the tube in by increasing the magnetic fields at the end of the tube or uh, but i mean this uh, is a possibility but uh, there are still losses they are too large the only solution is to bend the tube on itself and this is the toroidal configuration this is the best solution that is the way to confine it using magnetic fields in a closed tube now how to heat it and this is now the expertise of the laboratory of plasma physics of the academy here well the kitchen analogy is in fact the microwave oven there is a, a magnetron which produces waves which can resonate with the movement of the particles in the food well we do the same we put antennas in the edge of the machine and we inject electromagnetic waves which then resonate with the gyration frequency of the particles and so there is then resonant transfer of energy from these electromagnetic waves to the plasma particles and they get hot and <clears throat> the fusion expertise at the military academy is um, heating with radio waves from the short wave to the fm range in frequencies of about 2200 megahertz and we have we i show here several antennas which have been very successfully tested in the past and constructed and designed by and by the lab uh, the third one here is at the moment at the very moment being tested in windows 10 7x i will come uh, to this a bit later and we are also strongly involved in the construction and the design of the ether uh, antenna uh, which is in use for the largest tokamak in the world in construction in Kadarash. and thus the lab gets a lot of international uh, and national and international recognition this last weekend in the standard there's a whole article on what we have done in Wendelstein we got the front page of nature physics we got uh, very important awards of the American Phys physical society and now we come to the magnetic fusion devices which are in use for the study of fusion in Europe these are the tokamak and the stellarator and the largest tokamak in the world is located in Cologne this is not far from Oxford in England and it is called the joint European Taurus let me note that it is a tokamak not a tomahawk eh? and the tokamak is a Russian acronym for translated the toroidal, a toroidal chamber with magnetic coils and this machine uh, is about 12 meter high and 12 meter wide with a volume for the hot plasma of about 100 cubic meter and a magnetic field which is 80,000 times stronger than the earth magnetic field you see here the size of the machine if you compare with the construction workers these are the coils which are four meter high and two meter wide put inside the transformer of 12 meter high height here and so uh, <coughs> then we come to the largest stellarator in the world this is the Wendelstein 7x which is located in the Max Planck Institute in Greifswald of which you see a picture and uh, this machine is a highly complex machine in the previous machine the, the coils were planar uh, were in a plane these coils are not at all in a plane they are three-dimensional and the vessel also and this is needed for the stability in this class of devices you can compare with the worker here the size of this large machine now how does a plasma look like in such a fusion machine is a picture of jet the largest tokamak in the world without 
left and width operation with plasma at the right and in this elliptical shape mm, in the center of the shape you get in fact 200,000 200 million degrees at the edge you have 200 degrees the distance between the two is one meter and thus that means that you have a gradient and temperature of 200 million degrees per meter which is huge and which uh, is a, a difficulty to maintain now the status of fusion research well the parameter to check for fusion research is the power multiplication factor q and this is essentially the megawatts out the power out from fusion reactions divided by the power in from the heating systems and there are two main points which is break even when both are the same and when as much fusion power comes out as power is needed to heat the reaction and then uh, ignition when you can switch off the heating systems and the reaction sustains itself and what did we get in the past years well in jet uh, we got 25 years ago uh, two pulses uh, one very uh, large peak pulse and one stationary pulse at lower power and these peak pulse produced already uh, a result close to break even we had also stationary pulse which is then a pulse which uh, produced a Q of 0.2 and this we now improved we did a new set of uh, experiments in a, in, a, uh, in a modernized machine there we doubled in fact the output from 22 to 42 in the first set of experiments and then we tripled it in a third set of experiments and this is then uh, 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 three times more than the result 25 years ago and so we make progress in jet and this is in preparation of the next machine which is called ITER. ITER is this new international machine, JET is European, ITER is international and you see here the seven nations that directly participate in the cost and the personnel. And what is ITER really? We have to compare to the sun to understand what is the challenge that ITER represents. And the sun is an object with a central temperature of 15 million degrees, ITER will have 150 million degrees, 10 times more. The radius of the sun is 600,000 kilometer, uh, 600 million meter. This, the machine on Earth is 6 meter. Compression factor in size, 100 million. The heat flux at the edge is 60 megawatt per square meter in the sun. And at this machine, it will be of the same order of magnitude, 10 megawatt per square meter. If this is not a challenge, I do not know. Then, uh, this is some pictures of ether. Here is the ether side. 42 hectares it is one of the largest scientific projects of the world then we have here the construction hall which is 60 meter high and you can estimate the height of this uh, room by looking at the four construction workers here in the yellow circle it's a huge place then you see here the tokamak pit the place where the tokamak has to come this is about 35 meter deep and in fact you see here also all the observation windows to study what is going on in the plasma and then last but not least you see here the magnetic field coils they are eight meter high and four meter wide and you can estimate the size of these things by comparing again with the construction workers it's a huge machine and it is absolutely worth visiting it if you have a chance to do this and so ether at the moment is 90 percent complete the aim of the machine is to have a power multiplication of 10 that means 50 megawatt of heating power resulting in 500 megawatt of fusion power and this is comparable not the same but comparable as the output of dual one but now in fusion uh, from fusion reactors the pulses will be 10 minutes at the start and longer later and we hope that the machine will start in 2030 and if you need the latest information on international fusion research there is a special volume of nature physics of may 2016 where the laboratory also co contributed with a special introductory article on uh, nuclear fusion i can recommend it to everybody to read about what is going on and i would conclude fusion is a promising energy source for future generations you find more information on the website of ether here under uh, the page indicated and my final conclusions are the following Fu fission is a very good option for the future fusion is a new energy option under development with excellent environmental compatibility for the energy transition to succeed, we need peace and international collaboration as we demonstrated at ITER. Doom ideas and last generation ideas are nonsense. We had never so much knowledge, we had never so much tools and technique to solve problems. And then for the young generation, I would uh, recommend to invest in research 
study well and prepare your, your future. And I thank you for your attention.